Welcome to another Ideas That Matter interview. This time I have a good friend and colleague who I've gotten to know, I think over the course of nearly a decade at this point, Davud Gosley. Uh, when we first connected, you were actually over in Macau and you were if I, a professor of experience experimental psychology there is that correct assistant professor of psychology general okay so a more general thing but your your uh, background from university of toronto was in experimental psychology uh, although we connected early on because you were quite cognizant of some of the limitations of the discipline and assumptions, and you were already doing uh, interesting work that culminated in a book project, uh, a sort of critical analysis of presuppositions and things like that. And uh, now you're back in Toronto. Um, you know, there's a whole story to tell about how that happened that involves COVID and trying to get from Hong Kong to Macau and not uh, being able to do so, which I think people might find quite interesting. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in Toronto now, you have uh, a reading group that's going on. You have a Patreon set up. You have a lot of different things going on. I've been on your channel a number of times. You've been on my channel as well. And so it's kind of, you know, coming full circle to actually chat here. We've had, you could say, a lot more practice doing this than I have with most of the other people who come on here. And I think that I can also say, and I'd like to hear your reflections on this, you and I not only have a lot of practice talking together, and sometimes just for the sake of talking, you know, let's let's catch up and do a Zoom conversation, but we both have a similar approach. And I think perhaps you even more so than me towards taking things methodically, slowly, thinking things through, not needing to, you know, move very quickly into topics, sort of dwelling with them. And I, and you do this in your videos. I should mention too that, that Davoud has a video channel where you can find some great book reviews and sort of reflections on matters as well. And, and a lot of conversations, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's a good excuse. Actually, I find that, <laughs> especially academics, uh, some of them are, who are on the introvert side, on the introverted side, uh, I had this experience at conferences. Sometimes I would meet someone and I remember having read their articles uh, and, you know, I wanted, wanted to have a conversation with them and I would reach, I would approach them and they would be a little bit hesitant to like talk or be a little bit uncomfortable. It's like, oh, I just... Why, why do you want to talk to me? And of course they know in the back of their mind, but it takes a little bit of time for that ice to break. But yeah. having a, inviting people on uh, my YouTube channel has been a very different experience because everybody is comfortable to, have, to be interviewed. So even people yeah. who would normally be a bit more reticent or reserved? Yeah, I wouldn't generalize. Up. You're right. You're right. But there is a, there is a subset of people who, you know, they're kind of, professor who is comfortable giving a lecture to a large crowd, but would not be comfortable in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So there are people who uh, would be comfortable if the interview, if, if the conversation is being recorded, even for an imaginary audience who will be later watching. Yeah. So, I, I wonder if, to, to talk to people in general. I wonder if some of it has to do with your approach though, because you know, so one of the, the things that I've heard uh, from people I've interviewed, particularly if they're getting lots and lots of podcast interviews or stuff like that, is that they they like coming on with me because I don't ask the same damn questions that everybody else is is asking, and and we get to go into depth about stuff. So, you know, with authors, uh, they always hear where do you get your ideas from, and, and they get tired of like having to explain it over and over again. And I'm thinking that, you know, quite quite probably you are running into something similar because of your approach. You you want to explore ideas in depth and you're willing to take the time to do that. So is that part of what opens up your interviewees, I guess we'd call them, yeah, your, think, your, your um, dialogue partners? It could be, it could be, but it's one of those scenarios because I would never know because I, I don't think I've ever 
requested an interview or invited someone who I wasn't genuinely interested in talking to. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> no flavor of the month. But it would be good. It would be good to experience that though, because then I can tell if it is my enthusiasm that uh, kind of eases them into the conversation. Um, but I've had, uh, I don't know if you've experienced this, but I've had people just outright telling me I'm not comfortable doing video interviews. Uh, I'll yeah, pass. I'll pass on I haven't had that happen for a long time. I did interestingly have um, colleagues it, it, when I was teaching at Marist College in New York, I was doing a lot of video work, right? Recording my own uh, classroom lectures and stuff like that. And I, it, it's very interesting because I had a colleague who wanted to do some filming in his own class. And he was a very confident guy. But when it came time to do it, the day that we were supposed to do it, I think we were going to do two things. He was going to film some of his lectures and we were going to do a sit down interview. And the reason we were going to do a sit down interview is because he knew something, an area of philosophy that I didn't. And I won't say which it is because I don't want to out him or anything like that. Suffice it to say, I've got lots of gaps and, and he was filling in one of them. And, and I had my tripod and camera and the day that we were supposed to do the interview, he, he came out in the hall and he was sweating. He was mm -hmm. so nervous. And he's like, I can't do it. I can't do it, man. And I was like, I can't do what? And he said, I can't go on video with you. And I was like, why not? And he, he couldn't, or he couldn't even really articulate it. It was just that he was scared. I don't know whether it was because of the permanency of it, like the perception that once it's on the internet, it's out there forever or he didn't, he was risking like slipping up and saying something sure. that he didn't want to say, or maybe he'd present Forever, himself in a way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And I did actually have another colleague that I did a sit down interview with years later, who was a former classmate and he was fine when we recorded the interview. And then I drove back home and I, I had just started uploading it to my computer and I got an email from him. He was nervous about what he had said. And could he watch the video beforehand and, you know, maybe exercise a little bit of censorship over anything that did, didn't come across well? And I was like, you didn't say anything bad. So I'm not sure you're what you're worried about. But I indulged him anyway, but just to be, you know, courteous. But yeah, there are quite a few people, I think, who. Yeah. That's fascinating. Uh, I mean, I, it's totally understandable, too. I mean, I, I had some resistance before starting my YouTube channel, uh, the, the anxiety that is difficult to really formulate. Mm. But I think that what that eventually is replaced with is that realization that people really don't care. Like what, be, <laughs> what, what we're afraid of, like even people who yeah. watch, don't watch that carefully. Uh, and they don't watch the video to the end. And you know, they're like, they're, they have their own you know, interest and focus. Right. So there's really no need. And maybe the anxiety, you know, this is psychoanalytic insight, that the the thing, the anxiety that we consciously feel is covering up that other uh the the other thing of like what if people don't care? Oh, we so call, yeah. So there's two polarities. People right. will care, but they will care about the things that are negative about me. They'll focus in on my stammering or saying the wrong thing, or right. they won't care at all. And right, right, right. Interesting. Yeah. And I think because, I mean, it's, it's assuming that the indifference is harder to deal with. We cover it up with the anxiety about, oh, maybe we'll, they will nitpick and they will criticize me. And that, because that's easier to, to, to accept. Yeah. So um, these are like the people who they're going out on a date and they obsess over all sorts of little details. Maybe they won't like this. Maybe they won't like this. Should I wear this tie? Should I not wear a tie? Because they don't even know if the person will show up in the right. first place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's. I would say this, definitely this medium, the medium of video, video presentation being recorded, it's really, it's it has its own um, structure. And um, it's really comparable to other media like writing um, or podcast. And it, it structures our thinking and it structures our, the way we express things. Uh, so I think okay. 
you and I and other people who have a YouTube channel regularly post, we have this way of, we have this place to go, even without all these technological devices. When we think of something, we can go to that YouTuber place where we say, okay, how would I formulate this in the format of a video? How would it start? But with yeah, the yeah. middle point and that I would wrap it up like this. And so that's, that's uh, the process that we have. It, it becomes kind of second nature, but then it interferes with other uh, possible structures like writing a book because right. that requires a different way of formatting or writing a tweet because that's like, or, or I don't know, uh, other, other platforms like a LinkedIn message, other places that people write. You know, so this may take us a little bit far afield, but um, as somebody who does produce a lot of video and you, you do it from mostly um, where you're sitting right now, um, so you're not doing it with an audience in front of you. And I, I do a similar thing. I'm shooting in front of a chalkboard or I'm sitting in front of my books or stuff like that. It, it's pretty rare that I'm doing an event where I actually have an audience, although I, I record those, you know, every quarter whenever I'm being invited to those. And I know that it took me a little bit when I first started doing that in classrooms, creating hour-long course videos on existentialism, uh, and then started doing the, the shorter videos, um, it took a little bit of transition to talk to an empty room, to like look at the camera, and I don't even know what I was thinking. And maybe you, you know, you can tell me what you were thinking. Do you actually like visualize a person or an audience? Because now I just, I find myself, I just talk because I, I know in a sort of phenomenological way, there are people who are going to be yeah. watching it. I'm not I, talking into a void. I'm not yeah. just talking to myself. Um, how, how is it for you? And you're right. They, they are watching just in a way, way, way that is not, uh, it's asynchronous. But right. that, even though it is asynchronous, you, you, you can still feel it. Uh, yeah, for me, it, that's a great question. Uh, in the beginning, I think I was imagining a very grumpy person <laughs> being, <laughs> who is also has a very short attention span. So I was really like uh, being very fast paced. You need like, to rush, make the make case to them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of like I had to uh, unlearn that, that, that kind of, that's not the only way to imagine an, an, an audience. Um, and I think it really took some time to, to look at that, um, point from a different perspective, it really took me a time to really start speaking. Okay. At the beginning, I was I, I was doing something, but it was not really me speaking the way I am naturally. And I remember my wife would watch my videos and it's like, this doesn't sound like you. You're funnier in person. Like you're more relaxed. You're more chill. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. speak maybe uh, in a way that is more upbeat. But in these videos, you go into this mood uh, of... So, so now I know that is uh, it's because of the person I was imagining to be on the other side. I was tr trying to appease to that kind of very strict jury. Now, where did that come from for you? Do you think it was it was it like a reflection of experiences with students I, or peers or? I think it was my academic training and uh, the academic culture that I was trained in, and um, partly maybe some of my uh, the students that I. Uh, I'd experience, I always like, you know, when you teach, you always want to monitor the people who are most easily lost in the class. Right. Um, and maybe I was a little bit too sensitive to that, but um, yeah, I also think I took myself a little too seriously too. I think that was a problem too. <laughs> and like um, wanting to really live up to the, that, that imagined person standards. You okay. Know, regardless of how strict they were, but so it was built in. It was like partly uh, out there and partly inside. In, you in you could imagine life. that a lot of people going on on video and thinking about the permanency of the internet, the fact that even if YouTube you know disappears, these videos are still going to be floating around somewhere. That they could have this elevated sense of this is my legacy. I must make sure that it is you know, the best, 
whatever yeah. representation of me possible and my intellect and my ability to, right, to reach right. this. And I never had that myself. And did, did was that a concern with you when you first started? I would say maybe initially uh, a little bit, not legacy in that sense, but I wanted to get things uh, not too wrong. Okay. Uh, I wanted to not be like. So it wasn't perfectionism yeah. because no. that would be like trying to get everything perfectly right. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. I I don't want to screw anything up. Yeah, yeah, and I I think we we want to signal the right things. Uh, we want to signal that we are interested in these things that we are, and uh, we are interested in them in this way. Like you discuss, for example, Kafka or Philip K. Dick, but you express that interest in a you know, somewhat philosophical in a, in a distinct, in a way that is yours, that says something about your style. Yeah. Um, and I was, I think I started talking about the first video that I have is the oldest one is, uh, I just talked about the movie, the old movie Amadeus about the life of Mozart and the, the competition with Salieri. And uh, I just did, did a, included a couple of psychological observations about it. And I was a little bit nervous. Um, but yeah, it's that communication of, multiple things at once, what and how and, you know, why. Now, I would say, having watched quite a bit of your your content and having interacted with you, that oh, you, you do have a academic background and training and research in psychology as a field, but psychology is kind of a mess. You know, people think, you know, actually most of the fields out there, they're not just one single thing. There are a whole bunch of ideas and they bleed over into other fields. And I would say that your your approach is also very philosophical as well. I mean, what exactly is philosophy? You know, ask 10 philosophers, get 10 different answers, of sure, course. Sure. So there's even less consensus on precisely what that would mean. But so now where did that come from for you? Because as far back as I know you, um, that has always been the case so even when you were a professor of psychology, that's that's how I I, I knew you, and your work was meta um, psychological as well as you know focused on on the field. Where did that come from? Was it something in your education or your background, or were you just drawn into yeah, it by yeah, other interests? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, I don't think I can. Uh in a satisfactory way answer that question. I, I love the question. I, I wish I could give a, a good answer to it. I think for me, philosophy is associated with some things that are not necessarily associated in other people's minds. For me, okay. it is associated with a certain ambivalent kind of belonging. Like you're, mm. you have a group, like a family or a community, and you kind of follow along with them. You go with them in the same similar direction. But you're not in the middle of the pack. You're not in the middle of the crowd. You always like keep a distance, like okay. maybe 10 meters when they're all walking together. They're like, you, you wander around a little bit. And because you wander around, you have a distant view of what the group is up to, where they are going, their, their patterns of movement and sort of kind of like preoccupations with that. Where are we going? Where's the group going? You know, why am I not in there? Uh, with them, why don't why don't I feel satisfied just being immersed in the group? Right, uh, and I think uh, in, as far as I remember, I've had that relationship, that ambivalence, that distance towards everything, not just my uh, my formal uh, ac academic field, psychology, but even with like friends and family and art and you know other things that I've been invo involved with. So I'd like to ask you: Is that a fair description of philosophy and? Is it missing something important? Well, I think that it's uh, so. It's not going to satisfy everybody, right? And we, sure. and I don't think it adequately captures what happens in the academic field of philosophy. But it describes something that is quite important. This, uh, like you said, it's it's not distancing in the set of like setting up a barrier and saying I'm not like those people. Instead, it's a you know good word for it is reflection. You're in the crowd, you're in the family, you're in the workplace, whatever it happens to be. But there's also this this uh, part that that steps back and says, boy, it's curious that they 
they all want to do this thing. I'm not sure what they actually get out of it. And I, I, I kind of think that for somebody like me who doesn't come from an academic family and kind of just stumbled my way into philosophy and mm-hmm. didn't have good mentoring, at least while I was, you know, an undergrad, because my my professors didn't really, you know, care much about what we were doing. I had a lot of benign neglect. Um and who interacted with people from a lot of other fields, that's mm-hmm. a really good description. I don't know it would be a good description for some of the people who's like, their parents were philosophy professors and they, you know, they knew how the game was played and then they went into philosophy because they saw all these great books on their parents' shelf and they read them when they were 10 years old. I, I think that would be a very different thing. But I think the yeah. the way that you're talking about people getting into it, this is something that whether people have studied philosophy in an academic sense at all, a lot of people can relate to. And they wouldn't necessarily call it philosophy. They might they might use other words to describe it, but it is something important. You know, there's this, to, to sort of shift the conversation, there's like conjectures. So this is metaphilosophy. What's the beginning of philosophy? Does it begin in wonder and awe, you know, like Plato and Aristotle say, that's really ambitious. You know, I, that's not how it began for me. Um, is it like Epictetus says something a little bit more mundane where we see people saying a bunch of things and we're like, these don't add up and we have to figure out who's actually got things right. Okay. That's a little bit easier for me to relate to, but this um, feeling, I mean, what would you call it? It's not alienation as such, but this feeling like, there's something more than just what these people are talking about. And I don't right. know what the hell it is, but I'm I'm experiencing it. I think yeah. that's something quite relatable for, for many people as an origin point. But it could steer you perhaps into psychology. Why are people doing the things they do? Or it could steer you into um, even fields like mathematics. What the hell are numbers, you know? Um, wh- why do they why do things work the way they do? Or I don't right. know, it, it might even steer you into something much more applied like um, medicine where you're like, you know, you're monkeying around with things and you're like, why do some people heal and other people don't? Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't understand what's going on. Or you're in a hospital and you're like, these people don't seem to know what they're doing, but Mm -hmm. they, they, they muddle through, you know, so you, you go and study it. So, yeah. 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 So it's, it's very difficult to reconcile this way of describing philosophy it's difficult to reconcile that with disciplinary philosophy or disciplinary anything because yeah. discipline, especially when it leads to a comfortable, a comfortable kind of settled sense of like belonging to that tradition. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I never felt that I never, my philosophical uh, desires or a sense of philosophical community that I, that I saw it, it was uh almost never fulfilled with professional philosophers who were like, especially analytic in analytic philosophy, who were like very that, yeah. un- unquestioning, like, this is what we do. And like, you're interested in consciousness and self-consciousness. And, you know, uh, the, that's why I, uh, I reached out to you. And actually it was 2000, I just checked. It was 2017. I first reached out okay. to you because I, I saw your approach to philosophy was more, um, non-disciplinary it was it left room for more exploration and more other things other than just a set of texts a canonical text within philosophy it had room for literature religion you know other traditions uh, political traditions and cultural traditions Um, because it is those other reference points that allow us to distance ourselves from that original place so when I right. find like a group of friends, then I go from their perspective, I see my, look at my family. Or in my case, it was philosophy that gave me the vantage point to re-examine psychology from. It's like, okay, well, what would a phenomenologist say about these experiments that I'm conducting? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Anyways. You know, so to to shift the conversation again slightly differently, we we've been talking a lot about how we approach things. We could say as as uh, younger people, as students, all of that, and we've talked about our own work. You know, creating content. Um, 
but then there's also this sort of active side. So creating content's not not active. You are producing something. But there's a different kind of engagement that happens like with your um, book reading groups, right? It's uh, if somebody watches a video, they can leave a comment and they can ask a question or then you can respond to it in in kind. And like you said, it's asynchronous. But in a reading group, people have gotten together and they've all, at least in theory, have read the same book and they're not going to take the same things from it. Um, they've got different motivating questions, observations, and you, so a reading group could just be, hey, let's all get together. Here's the time and place. Um, we won't have any sort of structure presuppositions to it. And then you're, you're not really taking such an active role unless you're kind of a charismatic person and they all, you know, kind of look to you or something. What does the master say about it, right? right. <laughs> but instead what you do is you foster people thinking about things. Uh, and that sort of soft touch approach actually takes a lot of work, or, or at least I imagine it does, because I'm I'm less that way. I'm probably more bull in the China shop, uh, <laughs> giving my opinions and stuff like that too easily. Less, less about asking, you know, sort of guiding questions. Um, but you are more like that. You, you're more meiotic, you know, if we want to use the sort of Socratic thing, ask, and now you're not like Socrates um, carrying out all sorts of irony and, you know, <laughs> talking for page <laughs> after page of convoluted arguments. But there's there's an openness to the way that you approach dialogue with people. And I uh, think that's sort of a reflection of what we were talking about before, this this approach to philosoph philosophizing philosophy, mm -hmm. um, but it's also, I mean, it's more complicated, right? Because there's there's other people involved in the conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Um, I try, I try, and I've actually had a lot of trials and errors. The group started in 2020, and the first text I remember, I think it was a mistake. Now, the first text that I assigned to the small group was Gadamer, Truth and Method. I was oh, like, well, that's a big book. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, demanding. So yeah. I, I would say for people who are starting organizing their own reading groups, I would say start with ex accessible, um, easy to get through, maybe even a little bit entertaining books to mm. just get the format of the reading group uh, the, to kind of get to know each other, their, their, your interests. Um, I, so I made a couple of errors. I now, uh, what I realize is that I need to really get an awareness of uh, the group as a as a collective. So a kind of we emerges in any um, group process. Yeah, like us and a couple of other people getting together. There's a group. I, the group itself has a quality, has a presence, and the person hosting the group, or I don't want to say leading, but organizing, more responsible has to be in tune as opposed to dictating his or uh, their own agenda. It's very tempting to have one's own agenda and say, guys, yeah, yeah. you're going you're gonna to get through the body of work, Gadamer, Gadamer's body of work, and it's, it's going to be a lot of fun and um, kind of cheer people on. But um, I think the best is to learn. Like, it has to be... The process of learning about the group, the interests, what resonates with people, what the existing concern, the current concerns of each individual is, and how those concerns can enter into dialogue with the text that we are reading. Um, and it is it is a little bit demanding. Um, yeah, it is. it requires patience. But I learned a lot uh, from you and our um, your your especially your interpretations of or reviews of um, Gabriel Marcel. And the concept of av availability and being oh, open to right, it. yeah, yeah, uh, being open to what will happen as opposed to planning everything in advance. Like this conversation we are having now, it's like we are not, we don't know what the next thing we are going to say is, but we are open to it. And that openness is a decision. It's also a skill, I think, that yeah. gets better over time. Um, yeah, it's a disposition, you could say, that you can develop, but you have to practice. I, I suppose, too, that you could develop it and then get out of practice with it if you don't 
keep doing it. And maybe this is one of the problems with people when they become quite successful as intellectuals, you know, they, people, I mean, it's, it's very tempting when people start looking to you as like a guru um, to start believing that, that hype that you're, you know, somehow uh, unlike the rest of us, not making mistakes. <laughs> you know? yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, you can dismiss the people who are critics as you know, motivated by envy or something like that. And we see this happening all the time. Um, maybe, you know, somebody can start out as quite, open, receptive, and that's part of what gives them, you know, a, a platform to begin with. And then they, mm -hmm. they lose that as time goes on, you know? Yeah. 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 I, you it know, I will say yeah. somebody who you and I have talked about before, who I um, greatly respect, who managed to not do that, despite becoming, you know, a really big name in, in moral philosophy was Alistair McIntyre. Um, he was not, there's this biblical phrase, and I think it comes from the letter of James, uh, you're told not to be a respecter of persons, which doesn't mean that you shouldn't show people respect, but you shouldn't like prioritize the, you know, the uh, elite over all the rest of us unwashed masses. And he's he's like that. I mean, he would come up to me at conferences. Um, and, you know, I'd been in this, this fellowship with him and he would like, I would see him uh, sort of like leave behind the circle of the, the big wigs and just, he'd come over and he'd say, Oh, uh, how is your work going? You know, uh, what's going on with your wife and, and kids and, and things like that, you know? And I was, oh, this, is, this is really quite extraordinary, you know? Um, but you could also see it in the way that he handled questions when he would do mm -hmm. presentations and the things that he would choose to write about. And, it, you know, it's turns out that he actually has a great respect for what he calls plain persons, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, but you could still talk the talk without walking the walk. And yeah, I think a lot of right. successful people lose sight of that quite, quite easily. Yeah. Um, I wonder if some of that is, um, you know, declining a certain type of success mm. uh, for example like for my do, do you mean deliberately, deliberately declining yeah, it? okay yes yeah. so, so for example um so in my own case i made the conscious decision to just cap the group my, my own group to like uh, seven people people including myself and yeah. once we have that i'm going to maintain it and then people will come in and people might leave um but if I was, if I had that you know, growth mindset, it's like, no, I'm going to just keep growing. <laughs> and yeah. then at some point I'm going to hire interns, you know, or like people. And after some time, you just never see me in the group. It will just be me, my like former students. And they, they yeah, would, yeah. That was like we a pyramid or it's like a pyramid scheme of uh, breeding groups, philosophical discussions. <laughs> but you know, that reminds me of something. So a long time ago, I remember you saying to me, I hate the word content, right? And I think there's another <laughs> business jargony term that would, would be exactly what you're talking about. Things need to be scalable in order right, to be right. good, right? <laughs> and there's this assumption that if you can't scale it, somehow, you know, you're you're a failure. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. If it's not scaled, it's like a missed missed opportunity. Which yeah. is like, I mean, I. What if somebody just has a garden and wants to cultivate their garden without like turning it into a a jungle, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or taking over, like taking taking over building an empire. Um, yeah, it seems like the empire idea uh, and growth is is another temptation. And I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I'm curious about McIntyre's um, personal journey and whether or not he either like declining certain paths or not taking them seriously, not really over. You know, another, a good example of that. Um, there is an international society for McIntyre in inquiry and it formed, I want to say in the early two thousands and um, they had, you know, they have these conferences and I don't know if they do them still every year. Cause I'm not very active in it anymore. Um, but McIntyre, when the association formed, he said, I'm not going to go to your conferences. 
And now you could interpret this as like, I'm too good to go to your conferences, you know, being sort of like a prima donna. And that wasn't it. Instead, it was, they asked him, well, why not? And he said, well, if I go, then as you're like talking about and applying my thought, if you guys get into, you know, disagreements, you're going to look to me as the the expert on it. And I, I don't want to do that. That would be like contrary to my commitment to you thinking things out yourself and and developing that way. Um, And so he did make an exception for when they honored him for one of his birthdays. I think it was in, in Ireland. So he showed up for that one, but, but the other ones, he just won't, he won't participate. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) he doesn't want to know about that. Um, That's very admirable. That's very admirable. And and the other thing that that the McIntyreans did that I I think is quite good, and I don't know if they're still doing this, they they would bring in plenary speakers who in in one way or another were critics of or even dismissive of or, or, you know, uh, they they thought McIntyre had some things fundamentally wrong. And the idea was, um, well, you know, we can learn by engaging with them and uh, trying to see whether we can respond to their their criticisms. And I, I, I thought that was quite admirable as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Another sign for me is eclecticism. Okay. Uh, because I remember early on in my academic uh, career, I got this advice a couple of times from people who were very strategic. And they said... <laughs> Another I one of like, those buzz yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> so you you have to pick a topic and just drill down. Like you have to make that thing yours. And yeah. that like becomes your brand. So yeah, every every year you publish like 10 articles that are different, slightly varied form of the same article, but they're all on the same topic. And the next year, again, a little bit of variation, but you stay with that. That becomes like the theme, your research program. It makes you recognizable. Makes it easier to, to for people to give you jobs, job offers, and I mean, prudentially, if yeah. if what matters to you is the academic game, that's you know, yeah, yeah. good advice, I suppose. That's something else that McIntyre didn't do. Uh, he kind of pursued oh, different right, interests right. at different stages of his his career, like yeah, his, his, uh, Marxist phase. Uh, he did some even studies on psychoanalysis, and then uh, right. Aristotle, Tom, uh, Tom, his Thomism. He's is he still like recognized as a Thomist uh, philosopher? Yeah, and and um, but his form, but his form of Thomism is a very open one. You can mm-hmm. say. I mean, part of the the general approach is that if a tradition is going to remain healthy and robust, it can't close itself off. It absolutely has to engage whatever is is good or critical in the other rival tradition traditions and ideally steal from them and you know assimilate their 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 stuff you know mm-hmm. um not not exactly like the borg because it, it's not totalitarian but <laughs> there is something of that you know if, if somebody else has uh some valuable intellectual technology or culture you take it on and make it your own so i mean mm-hmm. in in the early 2000s or mid 2000s he published a set of uh, collected essays and i remember in the ethics and politics part of that he has an essay on john stuart mill where he's like here's the things that aristotelian thomas need to take from from mill as uh, the utilitarian and he published an essay on kant uh similarly where he's like okay kant's wrong on a lot of stuff but you know we're we're being foolish to dismiss this, this, and this. So he's um, he doesn't sit well, I think, with a lot of let's call them party line Thomists, right? Right. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. better convinced that Thomas Aquinas figured everything out. Yeah, yeah. What he described as uh, from the perspective of a community or a tradition being open to uh, for dialogue, open to dialogue yeah. with other traditions. The personal uh, version of that uh, is. The person who is who's reading a lot of stuff and doesn't settle on being a typical member of any tr- tradition, yeah, and just being like sticking to their group. I'm just I just hang out with other Aristotelians or other Freudians, and I only publish in Freudian journals or yeah, La- Lacan bros. And I and I only <laughs> eat Freudian food. And, yeah, yeah. You know, I only wear Freudian ties. Um, yeah. 
And having you know, food and dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would be that would really be something if you could pull that off. You know, <laughs> your dream life is very difficult to control that way. But I mean, I was thinking this this kind of swings back to what we were talking about early on at the beginning. This this feeling of like, well, I, I am with these people, but I'm not mm -hmm. just with these people. And I mean, I think you can have that within a intellectual community or, or a tradition. You can hang out with the phenomenologists and be like, well, I like what they're doing here, but I don't buy the whole program, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the concerns that they have, because within, within a group, within a tradition, uh, there are certain things that don't survive when they travel, when those concerns travel outside of that uh, mm. community. Like, for example, certain questions, certain esoteric question in Husserlian scholarship, like what yeah. does he mean by sign in the, you know, investigation number five, you know, when he, that like one paragraph about signified and sign, is that like, uh, you know, I, from my perspective, like I can't, I can't care about that. And so if I'm engaged with that community, I can only engage with those concerns that actually can travel outside. Okay, and can be connected to other things, and through that connection, their their tradition also has a <clears throat> higher chance of surviving. I think. Yeah, and, and, but uh, well, considered like as an institution or professionally, the people who do engage with those don't travel well concerns are the ones who are publishing the ten papers each right. year on on the the thing that that community rewards them for. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's an yeah, interesting dynamic. Yeah. 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 And many of them like say that, yeah, when I really establish myself, then I'm going to connect and maybe hopefully they, they will, <laughs> but they, they underestimate how much, whatever we do, whatever decision we take is a kind of training. Forms us. Yeah. 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 It's, it trains us. It, yeah. It's learning. Exactly. It's part of that education. It's not like that's other thing I do on the side and I am here on this I'm I myself the true me is is is, is a secret you know I wonder if people in situations like that because people can change and, and do often um but it's it's typically because of some sort of uh crisis you know you have a stable kind of equilibrium established or routine whatever you want to call it you you keep moving ahead and then, um, I don't know, you have a health crisis or somebody close to you dies or, I don't know, you lose your job or something like that. And then people suddenly, you know, start uh, becoming more flexible. Yeah. Because they have to be, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the question so, is raised there, like, if there's a, for example, professor of psychology who's out of job or a professor of philosophy who's out of job. The question might arise with that at the face of that crisis, like which one of the the things that I read or I studied are now coming to help me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Which one of them are actually resources for me in this new situation? And that's a kind of test. Um, I don't think I think it might be a very it might be excessively strict, uh, but it's something that I personally like to apply it. Yeah. I mean, we've both been through situations kind of like that. And this is something I wanted to, you know, get to talk about is your, let's call it the story of your trajectory, right? I mean, you, you start out in Toronto, you're doing studies, you earn your PhD, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're sort of doing all the right things. And then as you, you uh, pointed out to me, you didn't go directly to Macau, but you had this postdoc at uh, University of Leiden. And we kind of joked a little bit about when you're in your postdoc, you're not just doing research, you're obviously looking for jobs. So everything is very professionally right. focused, right? And then you yeah. get a job at a place that I think a lot of people would be like, what, where's that? How did you end up there? It, you know, in, in Macau, which is, I think not as many people know about it as they know about Hong Kong, but it's kind of a mm -hmm. similar structure, um, former colony, ethnically Chinese. Um, it's essentially part of mainland China, but it's own special thing. And you go there and you're you're teaching students and now it's a you know different 
academic culture, but still academic. And then COVID hits. Yeah. And um, so there's this, I mean, I'm not going to call it an adventure because I remember while you were going through this, um, I mean, it was almost Kafka-esque, mm -hmm. the, the struggles you had... Um, you were you were living in Hong Kong with mm -hmm. I don't know if you were married at the time yes or we whether oh, so you you had yeah, married yeah. Uh, your 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 wife and you would go back to Macau and before COVID this was no problem at all yeah right and then you had this long attempt to actually just I mean it's almost like Kafka's the castle yeah. where he every every step he takes is getting a little bit closer but you can never get in right. <laughs> Right. Well, it was like this. I was we spent the the Lunar New Year, the Chinese New Year together. Um, we went last trip. We went together in, uh, before COVID to Vietnam for a couple of days, a few days. And then we came back to Hong Kong. We couldn't suddenly uh, restrictions, lockdowns began. Yeah. And it was local at that at that point. It was February two thousand twenty, I think, if I'm not getting it wrong. But uh, so lockdown, and it was more severe for people who are not citizens there. So I'm a I was Canadian citizen, dual, like dual Iranian Canadian. Yeah. And so I had to stay on their lockdown, and we didn't know how long it will be. Um, so the un university also like they didn't let me teach online, so I just couldn't teach anything. Uh, and it was like every month, it's like okay, this might be the last month. Yeah. And it went on like that for 18 months. Uh, and then they said, you can come back at the end of eight, the 18th month. They said, you can come back, but you cannot leave if you come. And I thought, you know what? You know, I'm kind of like at a point where it's more important because of the COVID experience. I yeah. realized it's more important for me to be in a place close to uh, my family, my friends, to be in a place that it's like, a little bit more familiar. Yeah. And there were some political reasons. My my wife was also more comfortable leaving Hong Kong because of the, the CCP influence, the Chinese Communist Party, yeah. the extradition laws. And we actually went, we protested a couple of times in Hong Kong. Uh, that was also disrupted with, with COVID. Um, anyways, it put things in a new perspective. It's debatable whether it's a better perspective or a worse perspective. For me, I, I judge it to be a better perspective, a more life-oriented perspective as opposed to career-centered yeah. perspective. And I decided, you know what? I, I'd like to be in, um, go back to Canada, to live in Toronto and see what else I can do with my life. I know I'm interested in these you know, scholarly things and topics, um, but I'm not you know, as committed to serving a university Right, yeah, I've, I've done and, that and for six years. Yeah, and then yeah. Let me ask you something because sure. I think I think a lot of people who leave traditional academia, and 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 you did in a much more um, comprehensive way than I did. I, I I always kept you know adjuncting and stuff like that. I I moved from a job where I was up for early tenure and promotion, left that behind, moved to to be with my wife. And, uh, but I could still teach, you know, and, and so I could kind of ease into it. You made a much more um, radical transition in that way. <clears throat> but I think a lot of people, you know, they feel like if I leave academia, I won't be able to live the life of the mind, whatever, mm -hmm. to whatever degree I'm doing it, right? I won't be able to see colleagues. I won't be able to read books. I won't be able to write things. I won't be able to engage students. And that will be a catastrophe for me because that's that's what I really identify with, right? Mm -hmm. and you and I both made decisions based on the opportunities at the time and what we wanted to avoid and did so on the basis of, let's say, relationships. You know, you wanted to be closer to your family. You also, you know, you, you, you and your wife have this, this marriage ongoing. Um, I wanted to be, you know, I also didn't want to be in North Carolina. Being in New York was much better, but I wanted to be with with Andy. Mm -hmm. And um, neither of us did have to give up the life of the mind. No, you know? no. Actually, you know what? Like there are some perks to that, to, to my decision. And 
uh, I think you relate to this too, like not having to review papers that people request <laughs> or like yeah. not having to stay up to date with like a bunch of stupid like projects that, you know, and then I have to cite and criticize. Like that's such a relief to not- You don't have, have to, to do any committee work? work? Yeah, yeah, committee work. And you know, to, to the extent to which I was not living the life of the mind in my university life mm. was wild. So I, yeah, yeah. That's a good, uh, I think that's something that a lot of people outside of academia don't get. They have this impression that if you get, if you, if you wind up being a teacher and they don't, you know, distinguish between being an adjunct where you're just kind of floating around and very precarious or being, you know, an mm -hmm. actual professor where you're still, you know, you don't get to do what you want most of the time. They think like, you know, they've seen movies where you sit in a, a leather armchair and uh, you got your tweed jacket and you read books and your colleagues come into your office and you chit chat about Proust or whatever sure. it's going to be, right? <laughs> they think, you know, maybe you eat dinner together um, in a faculty lounge yeah, and, yeah. and you, you go in your classroom. Or exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people still think academia is like that and they don't realize what it's become. You yeah, know? yeah. The pressure is uh, high. The amount of pressure is high. It's a very performance based um, kind of field of, of work, kind of work. It's very metric. Everything is um, mm. symmetric. Right, right. Um, I used to have to like report my publications, up update my list of publications every six months or so. And um, yeah, these like implicit and ex sometimes explicit reminders that, oh, you know, promotion is coming up or, you know, this, you know, this or that uh, evaluation. Um, but, you know, I early on when I made my decision to leave, I was so like in favor. I was very biased towards my own decision. But now okay. I see both sides. Now I would see like, I totally understand people who to some, in some capacity, they stay connected to universities, academia, because it does has, have its own um, benefits. It is, it is in, in its own way. It is still supporting the life of the mind in, in many ways. But I would say to people who are interested in staying, uh, they, I mean, they need to be strong. They, and they need to make sacrifices that yeah you know that's that's quite true yeah and and there's there's less and less security in that lifestyle you know yeah. here in yeah. the united states there's a lot of proposals for political reasons to get rid of tenure but mm -hmm. tenure is a great thing if you can get it a lot of the positions that are created now are not tenure track anyway so you know um Mo, you know, the majority of teaching is done by people who aren't on tenure track lines now. I'm not sure what it's like in Canada, but I think it's kind of yeah. following along. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good business decision. And, you know, <laughs> in I terms of the institution, yeah. Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I actually had dinner with one of my former mentors in Toronto. It was, it was fun, but he actually said, like, universities are a business. Um, and, you know, some things are good for the business, some things are not good. Yeah. It's like, okay. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, so so um, another thing I wanted to talk about that you had mentioned before we got started, going back to the reading groups. Mm -hmm. So you had this uh, formulation of bringing a text into life, into one's own life. And now that's that's something we can do to some degree in academic settings. Like, you know, when I'm teaching philosophy to people who aren't majors, I'll suggest that, you know, what we're reading in Plato or Descartes has some bearing on, on their life. They could apply Descartes' method to figuring out if their significant other is cheating on them or not. You know, their ears all perk up when you when you say juicy things like that. Mm -hmm. But um Part of what you're doing with your reading groups is trying to help people see that the the text that you're reading, if they're going to be relevant, they have to have application to their own life, to their problems, to their challenges, to understanding themselves, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Occasionally you, this is related to, but I'm kind of take a detour. Occasionally, okay. I, I heard you criticize people for wanting to listen to YouTube videos fast on like times two oh, speed right, or times yeah, three. Yeah, yeah. 
And you made this point. This is really, I think, the same point that uh, you made, you touched on in your very last phenomenology of spirit uh, lecture, where okay. like, the, the point of about going through something, really going through something and processing it and coming out from the other side, what it means to really read a text, to uh, to bring the text to life. This is kind of almost like a cliche. It's It's difficult to describe it without you know, metaphors and which are themselves obscure. But uh, there there must be some dialogue, some back and forth to really read something in a meaningful way. And yeah, I think reading with other people heightens this point because we uh, can point to each other's um, maybe blind spots or limitations. We can figure, we can catch ourselves and others in moments where something is like, we, we cannot yet speak about this thing that we 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 have read, it's still yeah. we're still not there with it. It needs to be, it needs more time. Okay. To turn into tra to translate into my speech, uh, which is not necessarily a paraphrase. You know, I don't necessarily have to speak Hegelian. You know, convey Hegelian insights in my own words, but it's a kind of reflection. I'm influenced or moved in some way in the way I you know interact with my wife or with my friends who don't, we don't really talk about philosophy, but in some way, uh, somebody who is, who is able to detect those differences, uh, they can see the ways in which I'm influenced by a text. Um, and then when a group gets together and read a text, then the whole group can move in a way that is kind of responsive to a text. Mm. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are very, in a very uh, accurate way, we are uh, covering all the points made in this text. Yeah, I think yeah. It's, it, 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 it's about kind of together being moved uh, by this text that we read. You know, Roland Bart, and I forget which book he, he said this in, he confessed that he, when he reads, he doesn't actually necessarily read everything in mm -hmm. a book that he's reading, especially if he's rereading it, he'll let it, you know, his eyes will stray and a paragraph goes by and he's, he realizes he's just let his eyes kind of run over it and he's not paying attention to it. And then something will pop out and he's like, ah, this is, here's a nugget that I'm getting from it. And, you know, you could say, oh, well, I got to go back and reread that. I cannot miss anything from this experience. And there's there's texts that people feel that they can't do that with. If you're going to read Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, oh, it's so important that you get every single bit of it, you know. And nobody does really read that way because yeah, we're not yeah. we're not machines. Um, yeah. And I, I found it very liberating to see him saying that. I think I read it when I was in graduate school because it took a weight off my shoulders about what a, what, a, what I felt like, what a careless reader I was, you know, but it has to be yeah. like that. Right. I yeah, mean, yeah. Yeah. the texts are not supposed to be, I don't know, museums where we have to look at every single entry and linger over them. It's okay to go into a museum and look at, you know, the things that you're most interested in and and come back later for the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, also like a buffet analogy is good too. Okay. <laughs> like the desire to really taste everything in a buffet. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, that's that actually, that's a really good one because you have a limitation yeah. on how much you can have. If you were going to taste every single entree, it would have to be just like the size of a pea, you know? Yeah, yeah. And some some of the items, you can really appreciate them only if you're hungry enough. Yeah, that's if true. You have just, if you've just eaten, if you have like full of, you know, critique of pure reason, then it's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to go and appreciate something else immediately after that. It's like texts really require some time. So that liberation that you're talking about, I think it has uh, a lot to, to letting go of some demands. Like I need to understand everything. I need to read this number of pages or this number of books. Mm. And I, I really like, I appreciate how you make this point every time in your, um, in the videos that I, I've watched in your uh, self-directed studies, that really adjustment of pace and acceptance, accepting that is a big yeah, part yeah. of the journey. 
You know, I, I think part of the reason why I have to say this is because I do get a lot of people asking questions, especially in AMA sessions, like how much do I need to read per day? And, you know, you think to yourself, where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. This idea that like 50 pages of X would be equivalent to 50 pages of, of Y, you know? Um, so, you know, there, even with, um, reading fiction, so reading some authors, it just flows by quickly. I, I just finished reading four, uh, novels of Jim Butcher who I'm, I'm looking forward to reading more of them. They're, they're these great supernatural private eye things called the Dresden files. And he's a good mm -hmm. writer. And so the story moves along quick, you know, mm -hmm. um, there's other writers, where, you know, you really got to linger with it. Uh, if you try to rush it, it's not going to work. And that's just, you know, fiction writers. Um, you get to philosophy writers. I'm also working on Schopenhauer with a couple clients, different Schopenhauer works. Schopenhauer is fun to read because he's a great stylist. And mm. you may not agree with him, but you know exactly what the hell he thinks, you know. Um, so, you know, reading 50 pages of Schopenhauer in a day, that's doable. But, you know, I can't say the same thing about reading Hegel. And it's it's partly because Hegel is quite obscure. It's not because he's more profound or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, he's he doesn't express himself as well. So you have to really think about what he's what he's trying to say. And there's other thinkers that I, I think aren't considered that difficult, but I just have difficulty with, you know. And uh, it's harder for me to, maybe it's enthusiasm or I'm not quite getting the importance of what they're saying. And, yeah. and you know, if I can get 20 pages, that's probably good, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think every author has a way of, you know, reading a text is like looking at the tip of the iceberg. Mm. And you, you, yeah. you kind of infer what else is going on in the author's mind. But authors are different in which part they choose to demonstrate as to to reveal as that iceberg tip you know some yeah, some yeah. people reveal more concrete stuff some people just completely abstract like Husserl is very difficult for that reason <sighs> because you have to read through all those concrete uh parts of what he is going on in his mind and all the motivation all the justification for why he's doing that at least in the, er, his earlier works yeah but um yeah, people, uh, writers like Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, this like because they reveal so much of that emotion, the emotional tone of their writing, it's just it's easy to move with them, because that's the bit of the iceberg. That's true. That yeah, 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 yeah. It's very similar to people. Um, some people are just difficult to engage with initially. That's, that's true. Yeah. And and sometimes that can be because of our whatever our temperament, our characteristics. And I've noticed that sometimes changes over time. You know, we're, we're both aging. I look back on decisions I made about particular people um, who, you know, I think about family members, for example, because you, you're stuck with them for the, your whole life, basically, right? Uh, and, you know, there's some who you just couldn't relate to as a 20-year-old, but in your 40s, you you can suddenly find something there that, you know, is much, is interesting in them mm -hmm. that you can, you can talk about. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, have you had a similar sort of experience yeah. like that? Yeah. With each person, you have a kind of a contact point and uh, mm. I have this, I don't mind sharing this, but with my father, we almost like it's an unspoken thing that we, we get together, we have coffee and, you know, we talk about stuff that are not really of that import that much of an importance, but like in the back of our mind, something is like released or we feel, especially him on his part, it's like he's happy that oh, you're just talking about nothing. Right. Because of the fact that you are engaged with each other. Yes. Yes. I'm, yes. I'm having something kind of similar with my own much younger children where, um, for example, my, my oldest child, Kat, is getting ready to graduate from um, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee with a, a theater degree. And Kat has done a lot of work um, starring now in, in one play, taking on 
various jobs around town, house managing, doing all sorts of things. So very, very busy. And, um, you know, sometimes we, we make the time to like have, uh, uh you know, drinks together. You know, I have like a, a latte and cattle have a steamer. And then sometimes we'll go visit the cats at almost home or, you know, things, things along those lines. Or on occasion, if it's cold out and the bus doesn't uh, stop where it's supposed to, I'll give Cat a ride home from from work late at night. And, um, you know, we're both pressed for time. When we do get together, there's no pressure for it to be like an important event or anything like that, just because it's nice to reconnect. And sometimes it's it's only being able to text back and forth with each other. And uh, now I will also say it's been kind of a cool sign to see Kat moving out of adolescence and basically being, as most adolescents are, um, quite self-centered when it mm -hmm. comes to that, not not very empathetic, you know, placing themselves in another person's point of view, and mm -hmm. much more about having those connections. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's part of not everybody develops into adulthood in that way, um, but it's good to see when that that happens. And you know, when you take that pressure off, like experiences don't need to be important experiences. They can just yeah. be sharing time and space. I mean, going back to what you were talking about earlier with Marcel and availability, availability mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. what allows us to do that and to figure out um, what kind of what kind of conversation we're going to have or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whether we're going to talk about trivial things just to yeah. be with each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, because it, the other person, um, I mean, it's really fascinating describing uh, the experience of a child growing up and yeah. the fullness of life that is, you know, they don't fully express it, but it, it, it becomes increasingly richer and fuller, the material of life that they're going through and that is like in their mind or, uh, and they, they, yeah, they, yeah. Never, they can never be full expression of everything. Nothing, it can never be completed. But just being there, being ready to be moved or, you know, similar to availability for a text or a friend. I think that's, um, and it's hard. It's easier said than done. Especially yeah, when we really care about someone because yeah. you want to efficiently sometimes communicate something like, listen, I, I care about you. <laughs> Here's you know, how to solve your problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's, <laughs> practically, you know, we might be right, but... Uh, sometimes it, it's really what is required is a detour. And there's what seems like a detour is really a necessity. <laughs> it is the path. I, mean, this, I, I think that's a really interesting insight and it could apply to relationships where, you know, we're older or in a more experienced position. So it could be children, it could be um, colleagues, it could be students, but I think it could also, you know, be on, on a, uh, peer level as well, that being able to just let the person stumble through the stuff and know that you're actually in their corner without mm -hmm. necessarily, and, and ready to give aid when they're actually needing the aid, yeah, um, yeah, but yeah. not giving it beforehand, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, I just uh, maybe it's a good time to express this. I really appreciated your the way you communicated with me as I was going through that life transition, getting oh. out of academia. And I remember one time you said yeah, something yeah. that was really timely. You said, "You know, you are still uh, you're still an academic. You're still a scholar, whether you want it or not. You know that that part <laughs> of you is. Don't think that you're going to delete that part." And I was like, "Oh yeah, oh didn't think of it, but okay, that's good to know." Uh, because we might sometimes you might go too far disowning certain parts of ourselves yeah or certain parts of our past and that yeah yeah we should be mindful not to do too much of that uh, because eventually things need to be integrated and reconnected um, you know that reminds me of um something that Antonin Sertian says in this this book that he's got that i really like and i i think you've read it uh yeah, the intellectual yeah, life right yeah so there's there's uh, basically two things, and one is he's he's talking about um, the 
helping the neighbor, you know, who, who is my neighbor? What do I have to have for my neighbor? And he says, listen, as, you know, as an intellectual, it's not like you're not living a life. So you can drive somebody to the airport or things like that. Right. But you're working in the realm of truth. And so the person who is your neighbor is the person who's in need of truth or a truth. Right. And it doesn't have to be truth, the capital T or some, some huge, um, big, you know, thing that like we see in movies at the culmination when, you know, the, 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 yeah, the, the professor says something and the student like head, you know, uh, mm -hmm. lights up or something like that. You can just, <laughs> I can just be sometimes saying, Hey man, uh, look at it this way, you know, yeah. and you often don't, don't know it, but that's, that's what the, the person who has, and he doesn't mean intellectual in the, you know, sort of egghead intellectual professional way. He means like somebody who's Life is oriented around ideas. And the other thing that he says, and this is not his idea. I mean, this goes all the way back to like Aristotle and Cicero. They they thought you need to stuff your head with a lot of ideas. And, and you don't necessarily have to have them in perfect order because you may figure out what they're for later on. But they called that copia, <clears throat> you know, sort of abundance. And, and you do this by reading a lot. And and thinking a lot and digesting a lot. And you know, I, I suppose there's probably techniques and systems for this that you could, you know, order a course on or something, but I, I've never found that sort of thing particularly interesting or or helpful. But mm -hmm. you know, you just kind of read and and stuff things into your head. And mm -hmm. then someday down the line, in some totally contingent chance fashion, one of your friends or family members or colleagues is having a, a problem and you say, Oh, well, you know, there's this thing that somebody said about that. And yeah. you you bring it out for them. <clears throat> you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's that's one reason maybe why we should keep on reading, not for productivity mm -hmm. or even just for pleasure, but to have stuff ready at hand, sort of like putting things and tools in your garage and you don't know whether you're actually going to need them or whether your neighbor's going to need them, but just in case. Now, yeah. it's not to say you want to be a hoarder. No. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants but, to be a hoarder. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> People who are hoarders, you know, it's yeah. funny because we have a few hoarders in my family mm. and we have a name for it. And and I, I only found out about this later on and it's, it's not only like individuals, but sometimes also their kids, they call it the sickness, mm. you know, so-and-so has the sickness and everyone knows what it means. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Fortunately, the, yeah. the people who have that have spouses who will not put up with it. So every so often things get thrown out, you know. Right, right. But if they it's are left to battle. their own devices, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but go, going back to reading as, uh, I mean, two two phases of reading. Mm. Maybe really just one phase, which is okay. meand meandering through texts. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to going through a list of like, hundred books to read before you die, <laughs> which, which is, you know, that's like the canon, a more serious version of that is the canon. Yeah. Uh, the canon, I think is something that uh, we rewrite in retrospect at the end. Like, okay, this is, if I have to give a list, this is my, yeah, I like that. You know, but to give that in the beginning of the journey, I think is, is not fair because that meandering, everybody should go through that meandering. Um, yeah. Through yeah. The, through the possibilities. And, Reading a you know a few bad books to to find out what they dislike, you know why a bad book is bad, you know. Yeah, uh, and but, and maybe some mediocre books too. So sure, they're sure. not they're not actively bad, but you've got something to contrast the good stuff against. And and some books that later on, a decade later, I am embarrassed to admit that I ever enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I will never confess that unless you know I'm intoxicated or something. But there are, there are books that you I, I grow out of. You grow out of them. <laughs> True, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I had a, with the speculative fiction, um, st not studies, uh, worlds of speculative fiction things, mm -hmm. uh, I originally did that so I could do some guilty pleasure reading and oh, go nice. back to, to series that I'd liked before. And usually I found that they held up and that as an older person, I, I got more out of them because they were all classic series. Mm -hmm. There was one that I I chose and I read because I remembered just how much I loved it as a teenager and in college. And 
I reread them and it was Michael um, Moorcox Cornelius Chronicles mm -hmm. and they weren't terrible, but they sure as hell weren't good. You know, mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, what was I thinking when I was recommending these to all my friends and carrying these books everywhere that I went, you know, uh, and it was, you know, it was good to know that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, fortunately, most of the books that I, I've picked over the years have turned out to be quite a, quite good, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I think every, every book can be really good if it is, if it shows up at the right time. Mm. <laughs> I mean, timing can be can be a real help with our relationship with with texts and, and books and influences. So, books that we recognize later on are not good for us as you know, middle aged adults could have been good for the 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 time, the place that we were in as teenagers, twenty somethings. Yeah, but that I think that's what distinguishes really great works because great works like Plato's Dialogues. At yeah. different stages, we read we read them differently, with different eyes, different con That's right. concerns. Yeah. Yeah. But they always continue; they they persist. It's like, uh, it's like that image of the moon that is always follows the car as you're driving. You know, it's like, uh, the, the you know, so stable. so that yeah. brings up something that uh, might be good to end on because sure. uh, we, we were you know. I don't, I, I don't want to keep you up too late. You're an hour ahead of, of us. And um, books, so think about Plato's dialogues, right? You will be rewarded if you go back to them. And there, there can be books that um, it would be good for us to keep going back to regularly, not out of a sense of duty or anything, but because there's there's something there for us that we're going to get more out of over over time and now there's a mindset that i think a lot of younger people have there's the same people that you know hey is it okay to watch a video at, at double speed they think of a book as something that you read and complete and now you're done with and there are books like that right um a lot of genre things that aren't very good you read it you read the detective novel you know who the killer is well you don't have to read that book anymore but um good books in philosophy and literature and psychology and pick whatever other field you want, they, we shouldn't uh, think that we've finished the book. Now that could make some people anxious. They could have like a whole shelf of books and now they're like, oh, I've read the books and I still haven't finished them. Jesus, I'll never be done with all the, this stuff, right? Um, but that's not the attitude to have either. Um, so, I mean, are there books that we we just should never be done with. Hmm. And if uh, there are, I mean, can we, can we make a canon of them or should this just be like an individual thing books that yeah. you have that, that you can't ever be completely done with. Yeah. It doesn't have yeah. to be the same list as mine. Right. Right. I mean, it's almost like friendships. We, we are done. We are done hmm. when we are like for practical purposes, like life ends, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, like we have to end for that reason. Well, even but then even you still then, have to show up to the funeral. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why like people play their favorite songs or. At yeah. The ceremony, yeah. Yeah. At the, at the funeral. Um, uh, did, what's your question? Are there books that we are done with? We are ever done with, or we are, we are not done with i think there are books that we are done with like you know yes. you, you work your way through a textbook hey you're done right and that's right. fine because it's a textbook or a lot of uh self-help books or business productivity books or romance novels or stuff like that you're not going to go back and reread right. it right. that's why the right. used bookstores uh always have lots and lots of those kind of books um, but it, I mean, if you think of, so if we use, use bookstores, there's lots of philosophy books in there and that's because somebody assigned them for a class and somebody bought that book and read it. And then they're like, well, never reading this crap again. I'm done with that. Let's take it to half price and mm -hmm. get, you know, get some money back from that, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but that's, you know, it, it, you probably should keep your philosophy books yeah, and, and yeah. leave them on your shelf. And because you might go back to them again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there are books that I feel like I'm not done with without necessarily reading them every every you know a few years or so, but they're still working. 
They're okay. still doing their work in the back of my mind. Yeah. Uh, and then there are books, books that I know because, for, for example, the death of Ivan Illich, uh, because it is manageable, I can kind of like read it every once in a while, every few years. Um, but yeah, there's more like books that I think about than I, than I tell myself, you need to go uh, read them. And that's one of the advantages of it, I think, teaching, because teaching gives us the excuse. <laughs> and, and and not teaching is like just keeps books on the horizon. But yeah. yeah well, I, think... I mean, does does your reading group and, and the the videos that you do does that supply that sort of uh, excuse right. for you? Then yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the books because I host the group, I read. Um, there was a collection of essays by Derrida and uh, Simon Critchley and Ernesto Laclau and um, Richard Rorty. I read that book during this past few months uh, i think five times some of the chapters more than than others um and it's great i can keep reading that that, that work and then other works in in combination with like other works by Rorty. i ended up reading some other things by david and so forth um, but yeah i think that's the definition of the canon the canon is the things that we say i'll oh, go back to it oh yeah i like that yeah well, that's that's a great place, I think, to leave off with this uh, conversation. So I'd like to thank you for, thank for you so coming much. on. Uh, I don't think I've ever had an unproductive conversation with you. So <laughs> we will try. <laughs> There's always the next time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I'll, I'll put information about, uh, you know, where to find you and all of that in there. Is there anything that you'd like to say as a last word? Um. Just thank you to others who have been with us until this point. I know it's a, you're one of the few. You're in the select. <laughs> select few, yeah. That's it. Thank you. All right.